You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent Magazine for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers, and leaders. Each episode, we bring you behind the scenes coaching, news analysis, exclusive interviews, technology, and more to help you list more, sell more, and elevate your results. To subscribe to the magazine, visit eliteagent.com.au forward slash subscribe. Here is your host, Samantha McLean. Hey, hey, Samantha McLean from Elite Agent Magazine. Well, what a show our 2018 was. Some amazing speakers and some great learnings to be taken away. A real highlight for me from the two days was the opportunity to spend half an hour with Eric's speaker, Peter Sheahan, also founder and group CEO of Carrickens Group, someone who coincidentally I've mentioned a few times on the podcast lately. In 2008, Peter authored a book called Flip, At the time, back in 2008, which is about 10 years ago, I had just been thrust into my first sales management role and was feeling kind of unprepared for it. Standing at the airport one day, I picked up Flip and consumed it cover to cover on the plane and that night. And I have to say, it was kind of like my purple cow. That book changed my thinking on a number of things and some of the messages have stuck with me to this day. Messages like action creates clarity, sweating the small stuff, about business being personal, finding ideas on the fringe, and of course, something I've said a lot lately, to get control, give it up. So meeting Peter was a bit of a fangirl moment for me. For any of you out there that may not be familiar with Peter's work, he's an Aussie abroad who is known around the world for his innovative business thinking and thought leadership. His company, Carrickens Group, now has staff in more than 23 cities across seven countries. Peter has written several other books, including Generation Y, making it happen and his latest book called matter peter's messages the thinking that has made us successful to date will not be so in the future in many cases it will hinder us the expectations of customers and staff are changing so rapidly that you as leaders need to keep pace enjoy the podcast so welcome to the podcast, Peter Sheehan. Thank you, Sam. Your topic at ARIC 2018 is talking about how to create more value, how to exceed the competition and be the obvious choice. And we'll get to that in a moment, but I want to go back a bit in time because you are actually an Aussie living overseas. Yep. You've done heaps of things in America, lots of keynote presentations, all that sort of thing, and you're an accomplished author. So can you give us a bit of a background about your career to date? Oh, wow. In a short space of time. In a short space of time. You know what? I actually started my career going into high schools and helping students transition from school to work. And this is like back in 2001, 2002. And I noticed a really distinct difference in young people, quote unquote, expectations of the workplace and their employers. And thought I'd write about that. And I wrote a book called Generation Y, which Mm -hmm. turned out to be the first book in the world on what we now loosely call the millennial generation or Gen Y, and I kind of woke up at 25, the only game in town. Yeah. You know, two things happened for me at that point. Number one is I started doing a lot more work with organizations, corporations, and businesses and brands. And there's only so many times you can tell them about a trend before they say, well, will you help us do something about it? Mm-hmm. And so I built a Carricans group with a business partner, Dom Thurban, who's based out of Sydney as well. And we really do two things. Number one, we help accelerate growth inside a private enterprise. So we help them find their aspiration, drive alignment, and transform their business. And then two, we also help very, very large organizations build their reputation in the community. In other words, maximize the business value and social impact of their community investment. And they seem like quite different things, but I mean, you to remember I started in schools and you know, all these corporations were trying to build their reputation with young people and they were coming to me for advice on how to do that. And my advice was, well, do things that are meaningful. If you really want to differentiate yourself, as we'll talk about when we unpack matter, then make people a better version of themselves. Give back to them in such a way that they can't help but see and feel the value of that. And so I do live in the US these days. I live in Colorado, but I have 100 plus staff still here in Australia. In fact, our biggest office would be in Sydney around the world. So it's good to be home. Let's just say that. It's good to have you home. And it's great for me to be talking to you actually, because in 2008, you wrote a book called Flip. It happened to be one of the first books I ever read after being thrust into a sales leadership role. And I have to say it helped me shape my thinking immensely. And I think that there are some concepts in the book that are just as relevant now. So first of all, I just want to talk to you about counterintuitive strategies. So for those people that are not familiar with your work, Flip was very much about thinking counterintuitively. So Mm. explain that for us. 
So we're here at ARIC 2018, and the primary message from the platform so far today is just work harder than everybody else. Mm. And there is no question that real estate is a numbers game and a volume game and working harder helps. But I always want to know the question, how do you work harder on the smarter things too? In other words, how can you find faster ways to differentiate yourself in the marketplace and your success? And I think it's more than just working hard. I think it's doing mm. you know, different things. And so the concept of thinking counterintuitively is have the courage to elevate yourself above the industry standard and norm and do something new. I think a good example from this morning was Simon Cohen, the buyer's agent, right? So I'm from the US these days, everyone has a buyer's agent, it's a no-brainer, but he brought that back to Australia, grew an unbelievably successful business because no one else was there. And the way I would put it to you is, if you don't want to be commoditized, then you can't be doing the same thing as everybody else in exactly the same way. You need to be bringing something new. And from a real estate perspective, that's the application of counterintuitive thinking. Many of our clients are massive organizations, like some of them $100, $200 billion companies, right? And so the concept of counterintuitive thinking there is looking for uncontested market space, looking for new ways to create value in the market, new business models. And so that's really what Flip was about. It's always dangerous, right? I know you say like 2008, it's hard to believe that was 10 years ago. Mm. You take a risk when you write a book like Flip because you capture your thinking at a core moment in time and then expose yourself to pretty significant scrutiny when people have 2020 vision in hindsight, right? And yeah. so one of the case studies in that book was like Rupert Murdoch and News Corp had just bought MySpace, which didn't turn out to be a particularly good investment and Facebook was really unheard of at the time. Yeah. But the concepts of that book, like these meta level observations about how the world was changing, really have turned out to be true. So I'm grateful that I got pretty close to what was where yeah. we were going. I think your crystal ball was actually very on point, particularly through the book, and I'm drawing on my memory of it here too, yeah. but you talked about services have to be fast, good, and cheap. Pick two, like in the past that was the case, yeah. but in the future it would be they have to be fast, good, cheap, and have an X factor yeah. about Pick them. Pick three and then do something and, to and differentiate. Something. Yeah, and you're seeing that with... I mean, just technology alone and what it has enabled us to do. There are organizations, there are businesses, there are real estate agents who have found a way to deliver world-class service in a highly cost-effective and leveraged way that delivers and at speed, right? And then if you can get those nailed, you're at least in the game, right? And then the question is, well, what's the differentiator? All I was really putting my finger on there was rising expectations. What was good enough yesterday is not good enough yeah. tomorrow. And this counterintuitive thinking idea, the traditional paradigm was you can't be all three of these things. And it turns out you can and people are going to demand it. It's funny that you even remember the language, but to get control, give it up was yeah, one of the that last was pieces. One of that. my favorite ones, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there couldn't have been a more accurate observation yeah. in terms of, you know, you look at the power of brands has moved from company-owned curated content to user-generated content. The way we attract and engage intelligent, smart, talented people is no longer about dictatorial styles or command and control. It's much more about active choice and engagement. If you think about the use of data to transform industries, the things we used to hold on to and protect and control, we're having to give up to give not just us, but everyone collectively more power. And so, yeah, there were some, we put our finger on a few of them. I think absolutely, and particularly from a leadership perspective as well. I mean, this touches on your work with Generation Y, but they want to be engaged. It's almost to get control, give it up there, mm. like get them on the journey with you mm. rather than trying to tell them what to do. You know what we've discovered? It's more than just young people. It was any Everybody. smart, intelligent person was really looking. We're going through almost a conscious awakening of people's experience of the world of work and a breaking free of the shackles of traditional corporate and industrial revolution style life, right? But let's apply that notion, obviously most of you all readers are real estate agents. Tom Ferry did a good job, I thought this morning, talking about the notion of building teams and that trend that he was talking about in the oh. US, we're seeing here in Australia as well from Absolutely. what I understand. The number one thing that gets in the way of an agent's ability to build a team is their desire to control everything. Yes. The unicorn bias, the assumption that no one can do or say anything as well as they can do or say it. Firstly, you're probably wrong, but even if you're not wrong, there's no leverage in the model, right? And so in the same way, management consulting firms, accounting firms, law firms have had to find ways to build structure in teams, real estate agents are next. 
the disintermediation and the fragmentation on the agency side, I really can see just changing the next few years. Look, I completely agree with you. And one of my things lately is I've watched real estate agents control their data so that several real estate agents in the same office might have separate databases. Mm. And that can never give the customer a great experience if they're not yeah. from the, singing from the same hymn sheet. It's a little like calling your financial advisor and he or she can't tell you how much money you've got or what bank accounts or stocks it in because their systems are all so siloed, right? And so, yeah, I think this shift to teaming will create a paradigm level shift in the way agents have to think about everything they do, not just the data that they collect and, and how they share that. Yeah. Now, your most recent book, Matter, is about finding and identifying the place where you can create the most value. And in the book, you talk about the edge of disruption. So mm. the word disruption gets used a lot in this mm. industry. So tell us what you mean by the edge of disruption. Well, I'm going to tell you what I mean by mattering first, and then we'll talk okay. about the edge of disruption. Because one of the things that's shocking to me sitting in the audience this morning is the obsession we all have with gross commissions and our total sales volume, and I understand that we're incented that way and that we track and measure our performance that way. There was very little conversation so far at ARIC about contribution and impact and the role we play in people's lives. And Pete Feuder, who is on now, I assure you will reorient that language and I will be doing the same tomorrow, right? The concept of mattering and really differentiating yourself is to become indispensable. And you only do that by adding so much value in someone's life that they wouldn't want to do whatever that process is or solve whatever that problem is without you. And none of them are running around giving a care about your GCI, you know what I mean? They're yeah. like, what's your contribution? And so what we found in our research, we took five years to research matter, spent more than a million dollars a year on that work, is that it comes down to value, but there are very specific things that people value and they have nothing to do with how you're structured, how you work, how you're incentivized. It's everything to do with them and solving their problems. And so a big part of what I'll talk about here tomorrow, oh, and I know this is a, you're listening to this after the fact, but yeah. we'll be around what that really takes. But what we've discovered is it wasn't just how do you create value, it's how do you create more value? Mm -hmm. Meaning how do you create a level that differentiates you and therefore the only way you do that is by bringing you approaches and solutions to bear on the marketplace. Well, you know, all that talk about disruption changing our business model only feels bad to us because it's questioning our model, it's questioning our process, it's having us redefine who we are and how we do what we do. But inside of that, there's also a great deal of opportunity. I mean, you just referenced data. Can you imagine what our ability to capture and analyze data does now for targeted marketing and, and our ability to leverage social media to catch people when they're doing the things that are most aligned to what we're talking about, you know? I mean, in that very thing that's keeping us up at night and threatening our future is the opportunity for the future as well. And so what we call the edge of disruption is your willingness to get not on the bleeding edge, we're not talking about spending all your money on building a system you could never maintain or like, oh. we're talking about just getting outside of your comfort zone and beginning to test and take intelligent risks with and experiment with new possibilities that exist. And we call that your edge of disruption. So rather than just the edge of disruption, it's your edge. You find a place where you're gonna go and learn. And that word learning is pretty critical. Ferry talked about the growth mindset, which is at Carol Dweck's work. It's actually a lot of people's work, by the way, well captured by Carol. But this idea that we need to embrace a beginner's mind, we need to embrace a learning mind. And I think that's a big part of being successful at the edge of disruption. In the real estate industry, what I've found is it's often helpful to look outside the industry for what some of the other more innovative companies are doing. Because obviously, if you continue to look inside yourself, you'll come up with the same solutions to the same problems, which is mm. not where we want to be. It's called an echo chamber. Yeah, yeah. that's actually a really good way of putting yeah. it. Who are some of the innovative companies that you've worked with lately? And what is it about those companies that they are able to create or work on creating markets <clears throat> of the future? Yeah, so it's a pity this is not a week after we're doing the recording. I was in the UK with a very large company that's about to do, I think, one of the most disruptive things I've ever encountered in my 15 years working with senior leaders. And even though I can't give you the example, but in all, by the time you listen to this podcast, take a look at what's happening in the diamond industry, and then you'll know exactly what I was talking about. And what I love about it is their willingness to disrupt themselves. Hmm. They can see where the future is going. They are seeing the emerging competitors on the periphery of their industry. And instead of sticking their head in the sand and hoping 
it would be a long time before it had any material impacts on the business. They've decided they're going to accelerate the market's progress to what is an inevitable future, but they're going to do it themselves. So they have both control of the pace and also the ability to extract the margin in the future from that new disruptor. So I would say that's number one thing they do is they don't suffer from what Clay Christensen called the innovator's dilemma, that is the unwillingness to kill the goose that lays oh. the golden eggs, right? I'd yeah. say that's number one. That's the Kodak thinking, right? Yeah, I mean, Kodak invented the damn camera that eventually yeah. created digital, but the problem was they did that in 1976 and 24 years later, film is still going up and up year on year. You could forgive them for saying, let's digital. not do this, right? But they had a choice of accelerating the decline of film and being at the forefront of the digital world and platforms and everything that would sit around it or wait until it visited that world upon them. And they waited and it visited that world upon them and when it started to move, it moved so quickly that they never caught up. And they spent more time with lawyers trying to sue people that use their patents than they did actually focus on creating value in the marketplace, right? And so Kodak's a great example. Taxi companies are a great example. We've hated taxi companies for 30 years. They have not given a crap about any part of the consumer experience for decades. It's no wonder people jumped on board when someone came at them and went, hey, here's a new tech solution, we connect, forget the license. I mean, that should have been taxis combined. That should have been silver service. That should have yeah. been someone, right? So back to your initial question, which is what industries, um, I think retail are doing some interesting stuff right now because they have to. Retailers are getting their backsides kicked online. And as a result of that, they're having to create a whole new experience in the bricks and mortar environment. And I love what they're doing with the internet of things and sensorization and one-to-one -one marketing and data and you know combining the online and the offline world. It's a pretty interesting kind of space. And then third would be probably healthcare, actually. Yeah. Healthcare has been one of those industries around the world where you didn't have to generate demand, people would generate it themselves, you know? Right. And so this concept of patient centricity didn't matter. Actually, probably not unlike the Australian real estate business in the last 10 years. I mean, you could have been, and all you had to do was have a heartbeat yeah. and take orders, and you could have been at least a little bit successful, right? I'm not, I mean that to demean the unbelievable hard work and quality of the top performers, but it's been a good market. It's about to not be such a good market, I suspect, and we're gonna have to get good. And I think healthcare could potentially be a place to look. Yeah, actually, healthcare is an interesting one because we're recording this on an iPhone right now, which is in itself collecting an incredible amount of data on us as people mm. where we might get to a point where the phone's going to tell us when we're getting sick. Yeah. In real estate, a similar thing is happening where there is an incredible amount of data in the industry, not just on us, but on homes and all of that sort of thing. Where do you think that's going and where do you think the major opportunities might be for real estate agents in the future? Yeah, I think the simplest way to describe where it's going is there'll be less guessing in the future. It'll be less watch me blanket every single person in the neighborhood and call every single one of them. I think what machine to machine computing will do will allow us to be more targeted. I'll give you a good example. I was on Instagram on a plane I was in Texas, Dallas, Houston, I'm flying in New York and I get on my Instagram and there is a advertisement on my Instagram for a pergola. I had Google searched a pergola quote bid in my local market like three days before and somehow it's gone from where I searched it into Instagram and right in front of me. I called that landscape architect and by that Saturday morning before I flew to the UK where I was yesterday, they'd come and done a quote and they'd give me a bit, like it's just a mind blowing experience. So that landscape architect once upon a time would have to put an ad in a magazine and hope that that was where his readers would be. But he was actually able to target a person who was searching for pergolas in Denver, Colorado in the last four weeks, right? And so this guessing game starts to disappear. But in order to do it, you need a lot of data, it needs to be high quality and you need a great deal of computational power, right? And so unfortunately, what will likely happen is it won't be small businesses and agents who benefit from creating the platforms that generate the insight. That will be large companies, right? Uh, you're already seeing that with a, you know, we weren't isolating anyone, but they will definitely be the ones that have that power. But the power that it'll bring to the agent and the homeowner as well, by the way, will be an ability to leverage those tools, right? And I suspect that there will be an advantage for people that move quickly because that data will eventually be available to anyone with a subscription, right? And so 
unless you're an investor in the early stage business that's going to aggregate the data and build a platform, then you better learn quickly how to use that targeting. I have friends who for every dollar they spend on Facebook, make a dollar 30. Right? It's like a no-brainer. It's a license to print money the way they use geo-targeting and content targeting and search targeting on social media platforms. I mean, let's join the millennium. Let's do this. Yeah, that's massive. Yeah. Last question. What are some of the messages that you're hoping to leave the audience with here at Eric 2018? Yeah, so I'm not a real estate guy, right? So I think they've had enough messages on how to do their prospecting. I'm going to hopefully bend their mind a little bit about how the world is changing and what businesses are doing to succeed in the face of that change. And it will really center on, I think, probably three ideas. I'm still formulating as I watch all the sessions, but one will be tell yourself the truth about how much change is coming, about what it means, but also about the opportunities that are present there. Disruption is not just a threat. It's also happening for you, not just to you. Two, and this actually is counter to some of the titles of sessions here at Eric, is it actually is all about the outcome, right? The vendor doesn't get up and care about you and your problems. They get up and care about them and their problems, and your job is to solve that problem. Only one of which, by the way, is to get the best deal. Part of what you need to be doing is solve the other problems around fear and trepidation and anxiety that sit with that. And so what are those higher order problems and how can you position your skills and services against that? And then third and finally, and I think this is a message that's already coming through at Eric, is you know, you're your biggest enemy. You are the one who's holding you back, right? And so I, I will have given you insight into disruption, market opportunity, but at the end of the day, you either pick it up and run with it or you don't. I think that'll probably be the three main messages. I think they're all fantastic points and I look forward to seeing you on stage very soon. Thank you so much, Thanks, Peter Sheehan. Yeah. Cheers. To subscribe to the magazine, visit eliteagent.com.au forward slash subscribe.